Well, it's good to see y'all again another Wednesday night. Um, I'm extremely happy to be here like every Wednesday night to talk to you guys and to go through the Word of God. What He's shown me uh, throughout this week and throughout my study. Uh, there's going to be some very interesting things that you may have seen, you may have not, but I guarantee you uh, you'll get a blessing out of it. Tonight, we're going to start off with Kenneth Copeland with uh, an announcement, basically, that he made not too long ago, uh, October, October 22nd-ish, um, and he has some very interesting things to say that are relevant to today, and I wanted to show this um, so we can get a glimpse of what's going on. that has to do with the outpouring and this 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 mighty thing that has been has been loosed in the kingdom of God in the earth. The most important thing that has happened in the body of Christ. Some years ago, the biggest church split in history. Amen. When, when the Catholic Church split. You know the story. The beginning of the protesting church. Now, now you can really stop and think about it, brother. Among, among the people of love, we're called protesters. We've been protesting for 500 years, baby. church split, brother. I mean, that's the church split of all church splits. I, really. Now, <laughs> October the 31st, 1999, representatives of the Catholic and the Lutheran churches gathered in Augsburg, Germany and signed a joint declaration on the subject of justification. And so 500 years of arguments, misunderstandings, and sometimes wars began to give way to reconciliation and recognition of the gifts of the Holy Spirit as placed within the body of Christ. It ended. October 24, 25, 26. Be there. Now you can smile. <laughs> Amen. I remember how important that meeting was that we were talking about earlier. 
And, and that there were, I'm telling you, there were people there from all over the world, and it's going to be that way this time. The difference is in the statement that I just read earlier. That church demon has fallen. Hallelujah. Lord, we thank you. We thank you and we praise you and we worship you with all our hearts. Glory to God. I'll tell you, it, it is so exciting to me to see and to know things that for, oh my goodness, so many, so long ago that people thought was just no way. No way. No way. They read the fourth chapter of the book of, 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 of Ephesians and say, till we all come together in the unity of our faith. No way. But you see, once that main separating spirit of division was pulled down, it released the Lord Jesus to get this thing underway. Amen. Hallelujah. Praise God. I want to. Interesting. Yeah. Let's get this mic fixed correctly. So the event that he's talking about, October 24th, 25th, 26th of this year, 2017, is called Kairos 2017. I can go into a long spiel about what it is, but he talked about October 31st, 1999, was the time that the Lutherans... Catholics came together and the protest was over. Well, there was another time in 2016, I don't know if y'all heard, heard of Tony Parker. Tony Parker with Kenneth Copeland had a big meeting of uh, pastors and teachers and you know all these charismatics that got together, these leaders. And Tony Parker came up there who worked directly for Pope Francis and he came and said that the, pro the protest is over. It's over. And they actually... There was a, the World Organization of Lutheran, the Lutheran Church got together with Pope Francis, signed another document saying that the protest is over, and Tony Parker died like a week later, which I, mean, I don't know if that's a coincidence or not. But Kairos 2017, now that the Lutheran Church is in with the Catholic Church, now the charismatic world is in. So everybody in the charismatic movement, Kenneth Copeland being the leader, uh, one of the most prominent and richest. This event in Kansas City just happened October 31st. Um, now the charismatic church is in with the Catholic Church. Just to let you know, he's wrong, completely wrong. That Roman Catholics are not Christians. They're not Christians. There is at least a hundred things on the list that differ from a, what a Christian is. And so uh, I'd like to do a study on that one time. But I wanted to show something today that's happening right now. People are going back to the Catholic Church. And when he said that this is the biggest church split that ever happened in history, well, it is the biggest church split, but they were never part of the body of Christ. The body of Christ separated from that place, that from that organization. So something to something to think about. Can I uh, share something with you? Yes, sir. You know when you said, I mean, you don't believe that all Catholics are is going to have the end. I'm not saying their doctrines but for where they have, but I, I, I was so surprised when I talked to this man that's been back uh, about 22 years ago, and he was Catholic, and, and, and what he came up with is all on the basis of what you're talking here. That's the only man I've ever heard with. And I mean, he believed that everything that God gave us, and I'm talking about from the dirt, from the ground, to the, to the, the leaves, to whatever, he knew that God made that for us not to be wasteful. 
But anyway, when I talk to this guy, I, I just, I got to feel that there's some Catholic that I believe that they honestly believe that the Lord Jesus Christ is their Savior. And, and, because I, I mean, I don't want to get in heaven and say, well, there's no Catholic up here. The Lord's going to say, no, nope, just born again believers. Bobby, I've witnessed a Catholic and Roman Catholic, Catholic and the Roman Catholic swore would not take a trap. And I'm trying to tell him about Christ, and he said, you tell that to the Pope. There's a difference in Catholic and Roman Catholic. We're going to do a study on Catholicism and Roman Catholicism. Yes, sir. I do have a question here on, on what uh, Copeland said. I do remember the 1999 deal. Right. Um, when he said they, the, the big phrase was the just shall live by faith. Right. Was he saying that Catholicism now believes that? They came in to agreement saying that they agree with that, with the Lutherans. Now, if you know anything about Pope Francis, well, you know that he says whatever he wants to say. Right. Doesn't mean that he believes it. But I will say this about Catholics, period. They're, the word Catholic means universal. Yes. And it's all about ecumenical, ecumenical movement, which is universal movement. It's everybody is under the same God. Everybody is the children of God. That's what Catholics believe. So we're going to do a study on that. I just wanted to... We'll, we'll well, talk I about that share that because I mean I believe this. I believe that there's people who went to church all their life can be Baptist and then they still don't have it. Well, I'll say this about every Catholic. They believe. I'll say this about every Catholic, and I can attest. We have one pre prior Catholic back there. How you doing? Me a lot. Um, every every Catholic believes that you are born again by baptism. That is salvation at birth. When or you know, infant baptism is your salvation and the cleansing of your sin. So is that sprinkling? Is that what they do? The, yeah, the, the yeah, baptism of the child. Yeah. Okay. That's your salvation. Is that your salvation? Yeah. Okay, so well, it's a little different, right? Yeah. So we're going to do a study on Catholicism. But let's get into this because this is very interesting stuff that I have uh, been shown this week. I'll say this first before we get started. Again, I want to reiterate Bible study, right? Desire for the Word of God. The Lord Jesus says, seek and you shall find. Yes. If you seek yes. with an open heart the Word of God, He will show you. Yes. And in James 1.5, it says, when you ask for wisdom, He will give it to you. You see, I think that's a lot of our issue is that, you know, we, we are not really seeking with our whole heart the wisdom and knowledge and understanding of His Word. And I'm not pointing anybody out in here. I'm just saying as a, as a whole body, um, we're lacking in a lot of areas. But the Lord Jesus makes it clear. If we seek, we shall find. Yes. So, a little review over the second priest that we talked about last week. I want to mention something that I saw this week. Um, let's turn to Matthew 10, 21 right here. We pointed out a couple of scriptures that pointed to the Lord Jesus being high priest. And this is another one that is overlooked because a lot of people don't know the history of this and how it is that right here he's being shown as the high priest. All right. So the Sanhedrin, who knows what the Sanhedrin is? Sanhedrin is the great council that they were the judges of Israel. They were the ones that, that dictated the law. They, they judged everything. So in Exodus 18, and I, I write these verses up here so you can take pictures or whatever and go look them back up. Jethro uh, tells Moses while they're in the wilderness, Moses is the only judge and all the children of Israel are coming to him. And he's, you know, he's basically Judging this and judging that and judging their problems here, doing this, doing that, do this, do that. Jethro says, you can't do this. It's too much upon you. You need to separate it upon the, the princes of Israel. So he ends up getting 70 princes of Israel together, and they help him judge the people. Right now in numbers, it talks about a little bit the same thing. 
But in the Lord Jesus' time in the temple, there were 71 members of the Sanhedrin, the great council, all right? 71 members. So when you have the apostles going up, you know, Peter and John or, you know, Paul being in front of the great council of the chief priest, there's 71, all right? Uh, they, they were gathered in a rotunda. Who knows what a rotunda is? Rotunda is a dome-shaped building like the Capitol building or the Vatican, all right? This is the blueprint right here of the Temple Mount, or the temple right here, the court and the temple. That little red spot, if you can see it, that's where this little rotunda was, all right, in the temple area. And this is where the, how they met right here, all right? Now, there were 71 members. There were 71 members. You see 35 on each side. And then you have one person in the middle, which they call the president of the council. That president of the council was usually the high priest. Okay? Now, you can't see him right here, but off to, we were talking about the second priest or the deputy priest, right? <coughs> off to his right would be the deputy priest. And I just found out that there was a sub deputy priest. There was two one on the left, one on the right. All right? So if we look at Matthew 10, 21, or I'm sorry. Uh, you're talking about where they deliver them up. No, I think I wrote the wrong verse right here. Sorry, let me find the verse here. Oh, uh, 2021, I'm sorry. 2021. Or 2020. So this is the mother of Zebedee's sons. Who are Zebedee's sons? James and John, right? So verse 20. Then came to him the mother of Zebedee's children with her sons, James and John, Worshipping him and desiring a certain thing of him. This is talking about the Lord Jesus. She comes to him worshipping him with her sons. And, she, and he says unto her, what will thou? Or, or you know, what, what would you, what is it that you want? And she says unto him, grant that these two of my sons may sit, one on thy right hand and one on thy left hand in thy kingdom. Now, the picture that she has in her, her mind, most likely, is this picture right here. Because this is what they knew at the time of the high priest. Can my son sit on the right hand and on the left hand? Now what's interesting about this, you see how he's propped up? There's three stairs. He had a throne right there. That's a throne. And he was elevated above everybody else. So Zebedee's mother is relating the Lord Jesus to the high priest. Asking if my sons can be your deputy and your sub-deputy. You see that? That's interesting. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, that's, that's something that you really, I mean, it, it makes, when you think about heaven, you know, uh, she's, of course, she's talking about when he gets on his throne and he said, it's not my place to, to grant that. But the picture that she has is this right here. And I would have never known that unless I would have studied the Sanhedrin and, and how they view things. So she is calling him the high priest right here. So just another verse right there to show you that the Lord Jesus is the high priest. And all through here, people <coughs> pointing to that, you just have to dig in and, and see it. So, we're continuing on with the garments of the priest and the high priest. We talked a lot last week um, about a lot of things, um, some very interesting things. But this week, we're going to actually get into the actual garment and kind of what they what the symbolism behind them and what they are what they're for so who can tell me the first mention of garments in the bible yes um it's when adam and eve uh ate of the tree of knowledge and then like they made the uh, little uh leaf tunic very good that is the first time genesis three twenty one. let's turn there right
Now, what were they? What were the garments? They were fig leaves, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And in 321, he says, Unto Adam also, unto his wife, did the Lord God make coats of skins and clothed them, right? So why were they used? Why were these garments used? Because you had to have sacrifice in the Old Testament, the blood sacrifice. Okay. Um, that's close. But why, were, why, why did God cover them? Why did God use coats of skins? Because of their sin. Okay. Because of their sin. So the purpose for garments in the Bible is to cover nakedness. And a picture of nakedness in the Bible is sin. All right? I'll show you that right quick. Second Chronicles 28, 19. says, For the Lord brought Judah low because of Ahaz, king of Israel, for he made Judah naked and transgressed sore against the Lord. And then Ezekiel 16. Ezekiel 16. But saith, thus saith the Lord God, because thy filthiness was poured out and thy nakedness discovered through thy whoredoms with thy lovers and with all the idols of thy abominations and by the blood of thy children, which thou did give unto them. So that's sin, nakedness. To be naked is to be, to be in sin. So in Genesis 3, Adam and Eve transgress against God and their eyes are open to what they've done. They have sinned against God and they try to cover themselves. And so God is painting a picture right here with what he does. He comes to them and gives them coats of skins, which is right. This is the first sacrifice in the Bible. It's the first sacrifice and God does demand blood, right? So that blood of the innocent has to cover for the sin. And we're going to come back to that in a minute. Now, as far as the priests go, if we know that garments are used to cover for sin or for nakedness, this is the exact purpose of the priestly garments as well. And each garment has a specific thing that they cover and a specific reason that they cover it. So let's look at that right quick. And we'll hit a couple verses here. The tunic. So we have a regular priest over here, just an ordinary priest, and we have a high priest right here. All right. So the tunic is the coat, the white coat. It goes from the neck to the ankles and down to the, the wrist. We saw that this is a one-piece woven coat. The only thing that's sewn on it is the leaves. Right? Now, every piece of garment atones or covers for something. It covers for a certain sin. All right? So the tunic atones or covers for killing. Covers for killing. All these references can be found in the Talmud. They talk about it. And then Edersheim talks about it. And then if you want to write this down... BibleSearchers.com You can go type in Garment of the Priest It'll bring up all these Everything you can imagine And then you can go to the bottom and see all the references and You can click on all those references And see all these things So the tunic Covers for killing Covers for killing Now This is Again, mentioned in the New Testament. Let me ask everybody in this room. Who is not guilty of murder in here? Jesus. In here. Oh, 
Okay. Okay. Too many people, it's unreal. Right? Yeah. Matthew 5, 21, 22. So, we are all guilty of murder, killing. So this atones for that. The breaches, breaches, what we call them in the South, breaches, are underneath the tunic, underneath the coat, then the underwear. They go from the waist to the middle of the thigh. And this is to atone for indecency, or to prevent indecency, and atones for sexual transgression. So who in here is not guilty of adultery? Somebody raise their hand. All right. So obviously we need that garment. Now the next garment is the bonnet or the turban. We can go. You can. We can go into the details of how the width of it and how long they were and all that, those things. And you know there was a lot of work to put them on. And um, but. I'll let you do that research on your own. But the, the turban or the bonnet atones for pride. It atones for pride. So the Lord Jesus said, blessed are the poor in spirit, Matthew 5, 3. And to be poor in spirit means that you are wholly given over or wholly away from pride. Right? To be poor in spirit. So, we are all guilty of pride, everybody. Anybody want to raise their hand to say, I'm not guilty of pride? <laughs> That's the beginning of sin. <laughs> so we need the two, we need the turban as well. And the girdle. Which the girdle we are going to focus on tonight. The girdle atones for the sins of the heart. The sins of the heart. Matthew 15, 19 I just want to read that for you real quick. Matthew 15, 19. The girdle is very important, as are all these, but this is why. For out of the heart proceeds evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witness, and blasphemies. These are all the things which defile a man. So, the girdle atones for the heart. Now, the way that it's pictured right here is not entirely correct because we read in Revelation 1.13 how it is really used. When, you, when John sees the Lord Jesus with a golden girdle about the paps, and the paps are the, the nipple area, right? So it, it actually came up here, and you can read the measurements and all that too. This was a process as well. Uh, four fingers wide, 26 foot long, where they just wrapped it and wrapped it and wrapped it. Now, you see the, this is also called a sash, by the way. You see the part that's hanging down. Whenever they were in the service of the temple, because that was hanging down, they would just throw it over their left shoulder, right? And we also see the colors, the colors. And we're gonna talk about that in just a minute as well. Now, there is no shoes. Right? And there's nothing on their hands. We remember, we remember in Exodus 3, when God tells Moses, take off your shoes, or you are on holy ground. Yeah. Right? In the temple, they considered it the same. They did not wear shoes when they entered into the temple, because that was sanctified ground, holy ground. And... Uh, I forgot to get the quote, but there's a quote in the Talmud, the rabbinical writing, that says that if there's anything between the feet and the ground of the holy, of the holy ground of the temple, that it undoes your service. So that's why they wouldn't wear sandals in there. Robbie? Yes? Don't they have to wash their feet before they go into the... They do. That's what the labor, the brazen labor was for. They'd wash their hands and wash their feet. And imagine being in the desert, dust, dirt, you know, you wash your feet so now a little bit about um, the girdle antiquity of the Jews was written by Josephus Josephus was a, Ro a Roman general who's a Jewish historian and he actually writes about the girdle he writes about 
all the priestly garments, which is pretty amazing. Um, but he actually says that, again, this is not entirely accurate, but what he says is that those colors there are woven in a snake-like pattern, in a serpent-like pattern. So we, I showed a picture last week, and I should have kept it up there, about the Jerusalem Museum that had both the, the priest and the high priest, and his sash was actually right. It was woven like this. One color, and then the next color was woven like this. And so you had four different colors on fine white linen that were woven in like, and they looked like serpents. Right? They looked like serpents as well. You know. And if you want to go check it out, it's chapter 7, part 2 of this book by Josephus. I know Jonathan was, was all about where I find this at, so I'll make sure to give you some references. So now the high priest. The high priest, he has, first of all, he has the same clothing, the garments, as the regular priest. You see that? He's got the white underneath. Now we got the breastplate, which we're not, we, it's going to be next week we'll really dig into the, the high priest garment. The breastplate right there was, just, it was a span. Who knows what a span is in length and height? A span, it, yes. Oh, I think it was like half a cubit, about. Span. Uh, I have to look. I have to look. Nine, nine to eleven inches, or from the tip of your pinky to the tip of your tongue. I mean, thumb. So if you went like <laughs> tongue. So if you if you went like this, like that, that's the measurement of it. So it's just a little. And on there was twelve stones, representing the twelve tribes of Israel, and their incense. Uh, out in the wilderness, their colors. This is also where you get birthstones from. Same, same thing. Um, this, this, let me, the breastplate atones for errors in judgment. Errors in judgment. All right? And we're going to talk about that next week. We're just going to cover this real quick. The blue coat of the ephod, the blue coat, was this coat that the Lord Jesus, they took his vesture and didn't rent the coat, the, the soldiers when he was being crucified. This is that coat. Had one hole on the top. Uh, it was one piece. And then they would put the girdle around and then their arms would go through the slits right there. At the bottom of it is bells and pomegranates. Or... They're made to look like pomegranates with blue, purple, and scarlet color. And the bells, they were representative of sounding service, all right? To sound the service. So when the priest walked by, you knew that he was in service of God. The ephod is the color coat there attached to the breastplate. That atones for evil speech. Or slandering, and we're going to get into that. And the crown on top of his head with the plate in the front. There's a gold plate that goes in the front. Holiness to the Lord is what that says. It's tied on with a blue ribbon. That atones for arrogance. Arrogance. Now, the high priest, I made a mistake and told you guys that the high priest wore this one time a year on the Day of Atonement. The high priest wore this every day of the year and never on the Day of Atonement. What he did was he got in pure white. He took off his turban. He put on the bonnet. He didn't even wear the, the uh, sash with many colors. He wore a pure white sash, all white, when he went in there to offer the sacrifice for the people on, the, on Yom Kippur. So I'll give you a quote right quick from John Holm. The vestments of the high priest was rich and ornamental, and it was to create a greater respect for his person or office and shadow out as far as human skill could reach the glory of Christ. It is expressed that these raiments were for glory and beauty in Exodus 28, verse 2. Which types are, are the Lord Jesus, who is called in Luke 2, the glory of Israel? The magnificence and splendor of his dress 
gave a sign to his richness of inward grace and purity of soul. It is these two things that the church should be clothed with in order to qualify ourselves to appear in his court. Turn to Psalm 45. This is a picture of the church. And the psalmist calls the church the king's daughter. Psalm 45, 13. 45? 45, 13. We'll start at verse 11. So shall the king greatly desire thy beauty, for he is thy Lord, and worship thou him. And the daughter of Tyre shall be there with a gift. Even the rich among the people shall entreat thy favor. The king's daughter is all glorious within. Her clothing is, is wrought gold. She shall be brought into the king in raiment of needlework. This is the picture of the church being dressed in their spiritual garment. Now the woven coat, the one piece, the blue, uh, the blue coat. Just read this here. It came in two pieces, one in the front, one in the back, and the arms came out between, down to the middle leg. Bells and pomegranates hang, hanging from them, um, so that it would be heard in the holy place. Not only did this notify the people that was walking by to give him respect. It also testified of his divine preference and the sound of the bells. He desired permission to enter into the holy place so he wouldn't be punished for his abrupt intrusion. So he's actually asking for permission from God to go into the holy place with the bells as he's walking. So God wouldn't. It actually says, so you won't die. Very interesting. The ephod. Is a sh short apron garment that was uh, made with gold, purple, blue, and scarlet. There were two onyx stones on top, two onyx black stones, and on each stone had six names of each child of Israel. Now, did it not say, does it not say in, in Isaiah 9 6 that the government shall be on his shoulders, right? Yeah, that's exactly what that's standing for right there. The breastplate, four square, double. Now right here it looks single, but this is actually a double. You have one piece of fabric, and then you have another piece of fabric behind it. And in between there is supposed to be the, um, the Urim and the Thummim. Who's heard of that? Urim and the Thummim. Now, that the Urim and the Thummim mean lights and perfections. People really don't understand a whole lot about it. They know that it... Um, it was to direct the will of God, you know, and, and decisions made. Uh, I've heard it said that Samuel actually took the human and Thurman, Thurman out when he, was dis when he was going before the sons of Jesse. And he would hold them out like this, and they would light up, you know, if this is actually a tradition or a custom. They would light up in front of one of the sons, and then, or not light up. And so, after he went through all the sons, and it never lit up, he's like, Where, where's your other son? So David came along, he put the Urim and the Thummim, and God showed him right there that that's going to be the next king. I, yes. I can't remember right off hand, I don't know if I got it broke down, but somewhere they put it in the pocket. They also put that in the pocket, but they're not quite sure what it is. Right. It, the pocket is talking about that, the oh, flap. Okay. You, have, you have the breastplate, and then you have a, a fat piece of fabric behind it, and they put it inside that or okay. inside there. Okay. And they're, they're not quite sure how, how it was used, but... And it's only mentioned, mentioned a couple times in the Bible. And I'll say this. If you study the Mormon faith, <laughs> the Urim and the Thummim is a big thing for them. Because the Urim and the Thummim is what Joseph Smith took when he stuck his face in a hat. He stuck his face in the hat and he got visions <laughs> of what they believe in. And it was the Urim and the Thummim that was telling him uh, what they believe to write the Book of Mormon. Completely ridiculous. Um, the mitre, 
was made like a, a Turkish turban, wrapped several times, folded. Uh, in the girdle, we talked about Josephus. Uh, the plate, so a couple things here. The plate, or the holy crown, right here in the front, typifies the kingly office of Christ. Remember, everything is a picture, is a shadow. The breastplate typifies Christ's priestly office. So we got a kingly office with this crown. We got a priestly office with the breastplate. The Urim and the Thummim uh, is his prophetical office. He's a prophet. Teaching and directing his people. So, just a little bit about that. We're going to go into a lot of detail about that later on next week. So let's go to the girdle. This right here is amazing. And I've never seen this before. And if you've seen it before, um, I don't know why you're not telling people. Because it's awesome. So, the girdle was made up of four colors on white fine linen, right? So you have, I forgot to write this up here, but fine linen. Scarlet, blue, gold, and purple. Now I wrote what they stand for down here, just to give you an understanding. Blue, heavenly, heaven, right? So we talk about being a spiritual priest, being a royal priesthood, a spiritual priest. When we look back at them and they, all these things are woven into their, their garments, these things stand for something. They are pointing to a spiritual truth. There's a heavenly priesthood, heaven. Gold is divinity. This is why the Lord Jesus in Revelation 1.13 is wearing a gold girdle, golden girdle. He's divine. Purple is royalty. Remember when... We talked about this, if you were in this class, I think everybody was here uh, during Resurrection Sunday of this year. We talked about after they had beat him and they uh, opened up his back, that they put this purple robe on him. And um, they were making fun of him, but in reality, that's a picture of him being a king, you know, royalty. So, and then scarlet, which is what we're going to talk about here, this color, is sacrifice. Mm -hmm. Sacrifice, all right? And fine linen is purity. Purity, white. All right? So those are the colors of the girl. Turn to Isaiah 118. Isaiah 118. This is an amazing mystery. Come now, let us reason together, saith the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. They shall be as wool. Oh, they, uh, oh, they, though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. So there's two different words right there. Scarlet and crimson, right? That mean red. So... Sin is red, right? It's crimson and it's, and it's scarlet. And God is going to take that crimson and scarlet with blood, which is red, and offset it and make it white as snow, right? Now, the word scarlet here doesn't mean red at all. Doesn't mean red at all. It me, it stands for, the word is shani. The Hebrew word is shani. And it is an insect. Have you heard this, sir? No. All right. This is going to blow your mind. Watch this. This insect is called, the, the scientific name is caucus lycus. I believe that's what it's called. This is what it looks like right here. It's the size of a pea. It's a little thing. So, <clears throat> this is also called the crimson worm. The crimson worm. The reason it's called the crimson worm is because the female, the mom, 
the mother. She is the only one from both genders that releases or secretes this red fluid. All right, and this red fluid is where they get, they get this red fluid, they mix it with water, and they mix it with something else, and what they'll do is dye the white. <clears throat> and when they dye the white, <clears throat> it is irremovable. You can't wash it out. It's completely stained, all right? Now, when they, when this, how this happens is, and just, I want, everybody can write this down. This is, where, this is one part of this information, the biblical basis for modern science from this guy right here. Uh, even with the page number, you can go look it up, look this up, all right? So what happens is, is when the mom, when the mother is, when the female is ready to give birth, she goes and attaches herself to a trunk of a tree, all right? And when she attaches herself to the tree, she, as she's there for a little bit, her body starts to harden, right? It starts to become hard. And it's at this point that she has her children, right? <clears throat> now, her children are inside their eggs, and then they become larvae, and they're beginning to learn how to sustain life inside, you know, inside, the, inside her hardened body here. Now, once they're ready to come out, what happens is, is the mother secretes this red liquid. And what it does first, of course, it covers the children with this red liquid. And then it secretes onto the tree. All right? <laughs> Do we see where we're going with this? This is God in nature, by the way. It secretes on this tree. And then this is how they get this red color. They're covered, they're dyed, they're stained by the death of their mother. It takes her death, her sacrificial death, to bear children, cover them with her blood, her red secretion, so they can live. And when she dies, three days later, this pocket right here, or this, her body, will turn as white as snow, flake off the tree like snow. Image of Christ, huh? Absolutely. Yeah. That is the word scarlet. Now Moses, God actually gives Moses the recipe for the sacrifice in Numbers 19. Let's look at it right quick. Numbers 19. Numbers 19.6 says, And the priest shall take cedar wood and hyssop and scarlet and cast it into the midst of the burning of the heifer. That word scarlet is the worm. Now, it was recently just found out that this worm has cleansing properties. This is a part of the recipe for the sacrifice. It would take the God made this animal specifically for this purpose to be a part of the cleansing process of the sacrifice. Also, red is very important, obviously, from the heifer. The red heifer was a, a bullock or a, a cow that was completely red. No white hairs and nothing. And what's interesting about this is back in the, the tabernacle time, uh, back in the temple time, they had these red heifers. They had farms. What happened to them after that? Nobody knows. They were gone. And lo and behold, they're starting to make farms again. They found them and they're breeding them again. The Temple Institute. So, we know in the Gospel of John... That there are the I am statements, right? You remember these? I am? 
Sí, de Marco. I am the bread of life. I am the light of the world. I am the door. I'm the good shepherd. The resurrection and the life. The way, the truth, the life, and the true vine. But there's one I am statement that a lot of people just skip over. And that's this I am statement. Turn to Psalm 22. Psalm 22. Charles Spurgeon said that Psalm 22 was the greatest passage in the Bible. This is the, this is the crucifixion psalm or the psalm of the cross. Psalm 22, 6. But I am a worm and no man, a reproach of men and despised of a people. Of the people. That word worm is tawa. And that is the actual color, crimson. But it's referencing the worm. Crimson worm. Yes. Um, isn't there also a reference to worms uh, eating uh, people in hell for eternity? The worm died. The worm died. Yeah. Right. right. And that's totally separate. Oh. Totally separate. But this word here is crimson. But if you look in the concordance, it's the crimson worm. It's talking about the worm. So is the Lord Jesus pointing to this? Very interesting, right? The actual word scarlet itself, that actual word means sacrifice. It stands for sacrifice. The worm, this worm, commits herself, sacrifices herself for her children, and bathes them in the red dye. So, the color blue, just another point here, the color blue comes from a snail found in the Mediterranean Sea, and they secrete, it puts off a secretion, but that's where they get the blue from, they mix it with water and whatever else, and they get the blue for that. This was extinct. For the longest time, lo and behold, they found it again here recently. Now remember, the Temple Institute is starting to make all these things again. They're starting to look back at the old writings, the rabbinical writings, the, the Word of God. They're starting to recreate all the priestly, they've already had, the priestly garments, the altar, the, all these things. The gold, representing divinity, I put construction up there just to tell you a little bit about it. They used to press it really fine. Press it really fine. You remember uh, in Revelation when it talks about the streets of gold will be transparent, right? This is a picture. They used to press it so fine. And then they would, the artisan would actually cut the thread of that pressed fine gold. And they would use that and they would weave that in to the garments. So... Who is our covering? I want you to think about this. What is our covering? If our sins are scarlet and they're going to be made white as snow, how is that going to happen? Well, we know, we should know, that it's by blood, right at the beginning, that it's by blood of the innocent. And our covering, or our propitiation, or our mercy seat, it's all the same thing. Is the Lord Jesus Christ. Right? He's actually talked about as a garment. In, in Galatians 3, 27. You don't have to turn there, but I'll turn there real quick. Galatians 3, 27. <clears throat> For as many as... A, for as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. Mm -hmm. He is our covering. Mm -hmm. And then Revelation 1.5 as well. 
talks about being washed in his blood. This is the exact picture of this scarlet right here. Exact picture. Now our priestly garments, <coughs> being spiritual garments, there's a verse in the Old Testament in Exodus that talks about, I mean in Leviticus 17, that talks about the priest or the blood. The, the life is in the blood. The life of the flesh is in the blood, right? And it talks, God tells them that they must wear their garments bearing the iniquity lest they die. All right? <coughs> that is the same for us. We have to put on our garments because in Habakkuk 1.13, which Habakkuk is not really quoted all the time, it says God cannot look on iniquity. He can't look on iniquity. So if, if we are not clothed, if we are not covered, right? If we don't put on Christ, we don't have priestly garments on, God cannot look at us. He can't see us. He can't see iniquity. Yes? You know, Pastor Rose, what I say, he said, do you ever take a piece of red paper or a, a paper and put it in front of a fireplace or a fire that will make that white as snow? And when God looks down and see the covering of Christ on us, that's what gives us the, 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 our righteousness. Other than that, we are not. Right. You yeah. cannot, we can't stand in front of God without being covered. So this is a short study tonight. But this is an excellent picture that you can't find. It's, it's, it doesn't tell you that it's a worm. And it doesn't tell you how it works. Right? It doesn't tell you that. So when, when a Jehovah's Witness tells me that I, only, I go nowhere outside the Bible where you're missing a lot of things. Because there's a lot of truth in other places that tie into this and bring it all together. I thought that when I saw this, I thought it was amazing. It was amazing. And we're going to continue to learn about the garments, but and we'll end it here. But are, are there any questions over any of this? What was that verse in Habakkuk? Habakkuk 113. Right? Any questions? Are priestly garments important? Yeah. Absolutely. And remember, everything is a picture. Everything is looking forward to the heavenly priesthood. So the word scarlet is more or less pertaining to God, like He sacrificed everything for us, for me and the children. That word scarlet is the actual worm. Right. So, you know, when he it talks gave, about being... He gave her life up for offspring, right? Absolutely. Like God, did. he gave up everything for us. That's right. It's a picture. It's a picture of God in nature. And there are hundreds of those. They're all over the place. You just got to search it out. You have to seek. <laughs> and he'll show you. Any questions? Comments? I just wanted to share one thing with it. I mean, if you want something to get your attention, I was going through a real hard time. Well, this is back 30-some uh, years ago. And I remember saying this to myself. I said, well, I'd rather be persecuted for good than evil. That, I bet that's not God's word. And I'm telling you, as the Lord's my witness, I had my Bible in my hand. I mean, if he didn't open the pages, I don't know what. 1 Peter 3.17, the will of God would be better, the will of God be so that you'd be persecuted for good than for evil. I was walking out them doors and that bite, and I went, you've got to be kidding me. <laughs> I mean, I had goosebumps that would just yeah. covered me. I mean, and I mean, I didn't, I wasn't looking for nothing or anything. I mean, it just said, uh, you're wrong, Chubby, it's there. <laughs> <laughs> right. Any questions over this? All these verses you can go and look at, go back and, and research. It just tells you about God instructing them uh, how to make the garments, what colors. Hey, Rami. Yes, sir. On the scarlet here, what you showed us tonight, which was quite incredible. Yes. Yeah. Who was the guy that you were reading that was able to share that? Uh, it, the guy, there was a guy from uh, Last, Last Trump Ministries. 
Uh, he's a, he is an actual uh, Israeli. Um, and he, he does classes and things like that. And I, what I do is take, when I'm doing my study, I, I'll watch a couple videos and then I'll, yeah, if they give references, then I'll go to the reference and then I'll do my own study as well. And so um, I think he's got a, I forget what the video is called, but as he was talking about this, he started pointing it out. And when he pointed out the worm, I said, wow, I'm going to go, I'm going to go check that out. And so you can go on Google, just type it in, type in that caucus lycus or the crimson worm. It's everywhere. I mean, it's right there. <laughs> I've never, ever seen it in my life. But yeah, it's right there. It's impressive. Yeah. Uh, you, you know, when you're talking about the garments, and we all know this, but, you know, to go over it like you did shows the seriousness with which God takes sin. Right. And looks at my sin. It's impressive. Absolutely. Next week we're going to cover, so we're going to be, I mean, we've went pretty good on the the regular priests, their garments, and what they mean and what they stand for, what they atone for, the covering. Um, next week we're going to talk about the high priest and his garments, which we did a little bit, but we're going to go really in depth and bring the Lord Jesus into that and show you um, exactly what those yeah, are. By the way, uh, in two weeks from tonight, Thanksgiving Eve, okay. so we won't be having one either. And also the week between Christmas and New Year's. Well, good to go. Then we we could probably uh, we'll probably we can probably end the, the garment study, the high priest next week. That way, when we come back, we'll have a fresh topic. Okay. All right. So, any questions? Yeah, I have one, but that doesn't relate to this. Okay. Is the address correct? What you had there on Fish Lake Bible? Well, Church? it's the one I got off the line, so it better be correct. I'll try to call somebody, maybe Tim Moore, so I want to ask him specifically. Okay. Because so, that will be, um, what, two, two weeks? No, no, week from Sunday. Yeah. At mm -hmm. 6 o'clock, the Thanksgiving joint service of the churches. Do you all go to that? No. Some of us do. Some of yeah, mm -hmm. okay. All right. Depends on where it's at. Yeah, this is in Sturgis, so that's a little trip. I think they're doing a building program. Thanks again. This is good. Is there any comments, questions, concerns? No? All right, let's pray. <clears throat> Our Father, thank you, Lord, for allowing us to come here again, come together in a fellowship, and to do some study into your word. I thank you for what you've shown me this week. I pray, Lord, that you take what has been presented here tonight, um, bury it in our hearts, Lord. Allow us to ponder on it, think about it. Know that we are the spiritual priesthood. We are the, the the holy nation that you are forming. We are the living stones that you are building your building uh, out of. And um, it is for us to look back on these things because everything in your word is uh, examples for us, uh, whether it be the men that, that you dealt with or um, all the symbolism and all the, the figures and shadows and pictures. I thank you, Lord, for the knowledge and wisdom that you've given me. I pray, Lord, that you take it and, and use it for your glory. Um, and as we leave here, I pray for the people, Lord, that you would forgive us where we fail you. And as we leave, that um, uh, that you would hide your word in our heart and as we preach the gospel, that, that maybe some of these things can come up. Um, I do pray for those who are sick here at church uh, or in this building. Um, who, who can't make it on Wednesday nights or can't make it on Sunday nights. I pray for them and pray that you will be done. And I pray for my brothers and sisters across the world who are suffering persecution for your name. I pray that you bless them. I know your word says that they will be blessed. Um, I pray that you get the, the glory and the honor and the praise that you deserve, Lord. Um, allow us to be safe as we leave here. And I pray this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen.